No species on Earth embraces exploration with the same veracity as us. We've dived into the deepest subsea trenches, trekked into the coldest and most inhospitable environments. We've decided that the constraints of gravity simply won't apply to us. Time and time again, we have found ways to sidestep the limits of our terrestrial evolution. Where we didn't have wings, we engineered them, mastering flight to take us into the clouds and across the oceans. Where those wings failed to satisfy us, we turned to our understanding Understanding of chemistry and pointed that same appetite for exploration towards the stars, touching down on our nearest celestial neighbour just 66 years after first learning to fly. Though what still sits beyond our reach for the time being at least is the wider universe. We've sent out probes which over the whole of human lifetimes have only just progressed to beyond the edges of our solar system. The limit of those chemical engines that we use is speed, and the universe is a big place. If ever humans, not just space probes, are able to travel to our neighbouring star systems, we're going to need something new. Fortunately for us, we're at the early stages of development of a new type of fuel, leaving chemistry behind and moving to its slightly older, slightly wiser cousin, physics to harness propulsion based on subatomic particles. Today we're looking for an answer to the question, how close are we to building an antimatter propulsion system? Hi, I'm Dr. Ben Miles and welcome to Spin Up Science, where we look at the startups and spin outs that are translating scientific breakthroughs into the real world. Let's start with a problem. Back in 2016, we noticed a wobble. A wobble in one of our nearest neighbours, Proxima Centauri, which is about 4.2 light years away, meaning that the light emitted from it is about 4 years old when it finally reaches us. This wobble we see in observing it corresponds to our star subtly redshifting and blue shifting, moving away from us and moving towards us, indicating that likely it is being orbited by a planet. That measurement is sensitive enough to tell us that the planet is about 20% larger than the Earth and that it's in the habitable zone around the star, meaning that there could be life there, with some caveats that we'll go into at another time. This is the closest planet we have to aim for beyond our solar system. It represents the first logical leap, but how on Earth do we go about getting there? The fastest moving object that humanity has ever produced is the Voyager 1 space probe. Launched back in 1977, it is moving at a staggering 15 kilometers per second. That sounds pretty fast. It would take you to Mars in a couple of months. It would get you to the edge of the solar system in maybe a few decades. But to get you to Proxima Centauri, it would take you 30,000 years. And human beings simply won't wait that long. Now there are a few options for replacement, nuclear fusion which we talked about in a video here, laser propulsion using photonic pressure to accelerate a spacecraft, and then there's antimatter, using some of the rarest particles in the universe to accelerate a starship. If we can make that work, we can take that 30,000 year journey down to just 40 years, less than a human lifetime. But let's take a step back and ask first, what is antimatter? Antimatter was first theorized by Paul Dirac, the father of quantum electrodynamics, when he discovered back in 1928 that both positive and negative energy solutions would satisfy his relativistic version of the Schrodinger wave equation for electrons, meaning that the electron might have an equal but opposite particle in existence that had the same mass and the same spin but had opposite charge an anti-electron. This theory was proven correct in 1932 by Caltech physicist Carl Anderson, with this image captured from a cloud chamber that shows a particle bending in the wrong direction in the presence of a magnetic field. The radius of curvature indicates that it has the same mass as an electron, but it must have opposite charge. The anti-electron, otherwise known as the positron, had just been discovered. The first antiparticle of which we now know every particle has one. The equally exciting and terrifying thing about an antiparticle is that when it comes in contact with its respective particle, they annihilate each other. Both particles disappear and leave in their place pure energy usually in the form of a very high energy photon. There are companies out there at the moment, like Positron Dynamics, that are hoping that they can harness this energy and turn it into propulsion for spaceflight. If you look at the fastest object we've ever created, we need to push that to something that's a thousand times faster. That means a spacecraft that can really travel at a significant fraction of the speed of light. There are two main problems using antimatter as a fuel source. The first is storage. 
Antimatter annihilates if it comes in contact with matter. So what container do you keep it in before use and how do you stop it from accidentally annihilating? To put the problem in context, a kilogram of antimatter annihilating with matter would produce roughly the same energy produced by the largest thermonuclear weapon ever detonated on Earth, the Tsar bomb. A hydrogen bomb detonated by the Soviet Union equivalent to approximately 55 megatons of TNT. The second problem is that it's difficult to actually extract work out of these annihilation events. Although they release huge amounts of energy, how do you actually capture it and do something useful with it that propels your starship forward? Positron Dynamics have been working for a number of years to try and propose some solutions to these problems. By moving away from antimatter storage and towards antimatter generation, we remove the need for containment of large amounts of antimatter on board. Instead, antimatter particles can be generated by radioactive decays of unstable nuclei. By keeping radioactive sources on board, positrons can be generated on demand. The problem now is how do you harness the power of that annihilation to do something useful like produce thrust. Unfortunately, annihilation events, though powerful, create energy in the form of gamma rays, which are very difficult to direct and so very difficult to extract propulsion from. To put this in context, we typically think of X-rays as going easily through most substances. Gamma rays, it turns out, are even better at it. So the goal becomes, how do we use those annihilation events to generate instead of gamma rays as the end product, a charged particle? Because charged particles, we can direct and we can accelerate with magnetic fields which kind of goes back to how we detected antimatter in the first place. The solution that positron dynamics are working on is to use annihilation events to kickstart a nuclear fusion reactor in a process called positron catalyzed nuclear fusion. These fusion events can create the charged particles that can be directed and produce thrust. The difficult part that positron dynamics are working on to try and make this system work is how to do this reliably. The first issue they have to contend with is that radioactive decays produce something called hot positrons. The thing to understand is that hot is just a physics convention here. The physics definition of temperature is a measure of the average speed of particles in a system. So all we mean when we say these particles are hot is that they are moving very quickly. It's important to slow those positrons down here so that they're easier to control and to direct using a magnetic field to create a dense beam of positrons that then can be fired into that nuclear material, typically deuterium. If those positrons are moving too fast, you would need an incredibly powerful magnetic field in order to steer them. To slow them down, positrons are passed through a moderator, which thermalizes them, makes them the same temperature as the surrounding material. Unfortunately, this process is typically really inefficient, with only about 0.1% or 1 in a thousand positrons emerging from the moderator, with the rest annihilating inside it. This is one of Positron Dynamics' key areas of innovation. They have developed and patented a novel moderator structure, an array of dozens of sheets of silicon carbide kept in a vacuum to minimize the presence of errant electrons and reduce the chance of annihilation events from about 0.1% to what they report of about 60% orders of magnitude improvement. The dense cold positron beam that emerges from the moderator is then directed onto that nuclear fuel, which produces annihilation events, releasing gamma rays that destabilize the fuel, triggering nuclear fusion, splitting off charged particles which can then be accelerated out the back of the rocket to generate forward thrust. But you might be asking here, particularly if the journey is gonna be many decades long, what happens after a few half-lives of your radioactive isotope in space? Eventually, it will deplete its radioactivity and stop emitting positrons, so it's important to have a method of topping them back up. In a couple of renders of the proposed system that I've seen, there also seems to be a mechanism proposed to enrich non-radioactive fuel sources, which can then be used to emit further positrons. From what I can see, Positron Dynamics have chosen Krypton 78 to 79 because it has a large neutron capture cross-section, which essentially means it's easy for the neutrons that emerge out of the nuclear fusion reaction to be captured by Krypton 78 and transition it to Krypton 79, which can then be used to generate more positrons. And so we get to the important questions when we look at any early stage technology trying to move its way out in the world from fundamentally what is very early stage science. How far have they actually made it in this process? 
Good question. It's kind of hard to work that out. What I'll start by saying is that what it looks like they are doing is still very fundamental research, early on the technology readiness level spectrum, maybe even as early as TRL 1 to 2. Typically, it's quite hard as a startup company to deliver on this sort of early stage technology. Usually it's better to stay in universities or academic labs or industry labs with these sorts of ideas until they're a little bit further cooked, typically TRL 3 or 4, when you have some good proof of concept data that the idea actually makes sense. Taking a look at their Crunchbase page, Positron Dynamics have raised three rounds of funding for a total of about $2 million, with the most recent raise in 2017. In March 2020, the Positron Dynamics team announced a working concept installation at the University of Berkeley, California. If they can reliably capture cold positrons in sufficient quantities, then the core concept behind antimatter catalyzed fusion engines will be proven, laying the foundation for a working antimatter propulsion system. Although the dream of visiting Proxima Centauri is the vision for the future, the company typically raises investment around the idea of applying this technology into the satellite sector, specifically for CubeSats, which are some of the most common small satellites deployed in large constellations around the world, an example of which is SpaceX's Starlink network, which is providing satellite-enabled internet. The pros and cons of CubeSats is that because they are small and cheap, they typically don't have very good, if any at all, onboard propulsion. So after a few years, they typically fall out of orbit and burn up in the atmosphere. Positron Dynamics is proposing to extend that useful working lifetime with their radioisotope positron propulsion systems. The risk here is that it's actually potentially a good thing that CubeSats have such a short lifetime because it allows for technology refresh rates of constellations as hardware improves. We're moving away from satellites that sit up in space for 30 years at a time with increasingly out of date technology on them. The other big sell here is in aviation. If the Positron Dynamics team can develop their system sufficiently so that it can be made available in commercial aerospace in low Earth orbit, we could see both flight times and CO2 emissions associated with flying significantly reduced. Worldwide, flights produced 915 million tons of CO2 in 2019, which is about 2% of the world's CO2 emissions. The important thing to keep in mind is that with all deep tech companies, the pathway to realization is long, but the change this technology could have on our species and our galaxy could be huge. But maybe the last thing we need is more humans out there among the stars. What do you think? If you enjoyed this video, check out our video here on how the quantum computer might destroy the internet. Do leave a like or a comment and subscribe to see more. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.